right, we good? We about our hit our time. We're at four. We are at four. All right, exactly. Welcome. Hi. To Hi. sword <laughs> techniques of the silver screen. Basically, what we're going to talk about here, we're going to talk about um, the origins of the classic Hollywood swashbuckling style of fighting and how that influenced what influenced that style and how it was carried forward into what we see in some of today's cinema. So we'll have some clips for you later on, obviously Adventures of Robin Hood. Um, and, but before we get to that, we want to give, kind of give a little bit of intro into who we are and then into stage combat a little bit. I'll let Kristen go ahead and introduce herself. Cool. So, uh, help you out. Uh, so I'm Kristen Brumley. I am assisting. Um, I do HEMA, which is the Historical European Martial Arts. Um, but I also do uh, stage combat. Um, I produce a web series called Basic Adventuring 101, which is about LARPing. And um, season one just came out this year. We Very exciting. Um, but so we deal with a lot of like stage combat through um, film, essentially, which is a great combination of taking um, my, my many loves into like one, one thing. One glorious, one glorious thing. Okay, good. I'm Alan Johnson. I'm with the Palmetto Knights. Um, we do all sorts of armored and unarmored fighting. Um, I'm also an actor combatant with the Society of American Fight Directors, and I'm a screenwriter by trade. So I, I write for film. In fact, I got another one tonight, uh, 10 o'clock. I think it's writing and fighting is what it's called, or something like that. It might be reversed. Um, we're talking more about how to write fight scenes, um, and. This is what we do. We fight, and occasionally we'll work on film stuff, and um, so hopefully you guys will, will enjoy it. Um, like with most things in Hollywood, uh, it's the, the history can get a little skewed uh, as far as what actually um, they're portraying and what happened in reality. Um, up until about 25 years ago, um, People who are involved in filmmaking and theater did not have the huge amount of historic manuals that we have today to actually learn how, to pe how people fought with real weapons. So they had to figure out the best way they could. In the early Hollywood uh, era, what they did is that they reverted to sport fencing coaches to come in and teach their actors how to fight. So your, your early Errol Flynn's and, and Basil Rathbones and all those great guys, uh, the golden age of, of Hollywood cinema, were basically taught how to fight through Olympic style sport fencing um, with a little bit of style and panache thrown in there. Um, but they really didn't care about historical accuracy. So in their attempt to take what they knew from sport fencing and combine it with some fun theatrical stuff, they kind of developed a new style. Another element that was brought in were people coming out of old Victorian theater. And what the Victorian theater folks did is that they developed series of stock phrases or uh, techniques that they would use and basically pass around to each other so everybody knew these techniques. So when you go into a new production, you could very quickly put together choreography if you understood what these techniques were. A lot of them have been lost, but some of them have been kind of resurrected in research. There's a great guy named H. Russ Brown from the Society of American Fight Directors who gave me most of my information about these things. So we're going to show you uh, some of these stock phrases that were prominent in uh, the Victorian theater era and used heavily in the early swashbuckling films. So um, what we're using today for our, our tools. This is basically what we call a single sword in, in the stage combat circles. But it's basically just a modified sport epee blade mounted on a saber. It's very light, very fast, and it's got nice swishy stuff. And because it's a triangular blade, it catches the light and it looks pretty and makes great noise. Get that little ring going. But all the music was added in on top of it, so it really didn't matter. Um, but this is very uh, characteristic of uh, the Hollywood swashbuckling style is very light, is very fast and flamboyant. I'm using a lot of F words. Um, <laughs> but that was the style. It was very fun. Another one. Um, it wasn't intended to be gruesome, heavy, brutal. We don't see a lot of that during this time period. And so the techniques reflect that attitude towards stage combat. Um, the first one we're going to do is one called bell clangers. 
and it's basically alternating thrusts and parries. So I'm going to thrust in at Kristen, and she's just going to beat it to the side, and then she's going to counter at me and to the side. And that's all we're doing. That's a bell clanger. A lot of times, this would also be called traveling music. Um, when people would uh, do a technique on screen, and then they had to move off screen to get into another location, like on the dramatic staircase scene, they would move, like you come through, they keep advancing. And they do this till they are off camera. It's a really quick and easy way to get off camera to set up for the next shot. So that was used commonly for that. Um, there's a guy, a ra guy named Ralph Faulkner, who's one of the early uh, Hollywood uh, coaches for fencing. Um, and he developed a technique they call the Faulkner 3. Um, and it is a high, low, high pattern on one target. So I'm going to extend, strike high, low, and then high again. So, and again, keeping with the light. Um, so let me get in my way. Get in my All right. <laughs> so we go high, low, high. And again, it's I'm not hacking and hacking. That's, that's not what we're doing here. It's supposed to be very light, very fluid. So it's all from the wrist and the elbow. High, low, high. And the more of this dramatic lunge I can get in there, that's, that's you know, again, very flashy. I don't really need to lunge this deep. But it paints a pretty picture. You know, you're ready to put somebody on a post for doing that. Another thing that we do in stage combat, especially if you're doing uh, theatrical combat um, on a legitimate stage, we take very good care of each other. She is not my opponent, she's my partner. It's more of a dance. We're trying to uh, help each other out, perform the scene and tell the story. So because accidents sometimes happen and sometimes you forget lines, sometimes you forget moves and choreography. So normally if we were fighting for real and I'd be targeting her head, I would cut from this range. Because that's the, that's the range her head is in. When we're doing stage combat, I cut here. Because even if she were to miss and parry low, I'm not going to hit her. Right? So again, if I'm cutting down at the head, I'm cutting, she's stepping out. But I'm cutting in such a way that even if she were to miss the parry, I'm not hitting her. That's why you see so much uh, stage combat happening in this space between us, as opposed to actually targeting body parts. Um, another thing is that uh, even though we're fighting in a three-dimensional plane, um, when we're watching it on TV, it gets flattened to two dimensions, right? So if, uh, if she thrusts to my chest and I parry this way, oh, there we go. even though I've parried it, what does it look like? It looks like it's gone right through me. It's really hard to tell, if, especially if you're watching on a TV. She, no one can tell if I've blocked that or not. Now that we hit, she does it again, thrust, and I block it out here, we see that space. You're like, oh, okay, he's safe. He blocked it. But if I were here and blocking it, it looks like it's gone right through me. So being mindful of how the end product is being viewed, if it's on a screen, that can affect how you do your choreography. Again, if she cuts up my leg and I block it here, you can't tell if I've blocked that or not based on my obviously in my reaction to tell the story or not. But here, it's much more clear. So that's another reason why a lot of the stage fighting is actually outside of the range of what you would actually fight people at if these were live blades where we're actually trying to hurt each other. Um, so where are we? That was the Faulkner three cut. All right, this is another high-low pattern where I'm going to cut to her outside line. She's going to block. And now she's going to cut to a low side I'm going to block, and then I'm going to come to a high. So it's going back and forth, high, low. Here, here, here. Yeah. And it, it can continue on as many times as you want. Um, so that's your, your high, low pattern going back and forth that way. Um, rolling ones. This is a fun one. Uh, this is alternating head cuts. So I'm going to cut at Kristen's head, and she's going to block, and now counterattack to mine. When I'm getting out of the way, and this is dramatic, and we're doing a lot of movement here, and you're telling the story with how your body is moving. If we're both standing face to face and just going back and forth, you can't tell who's winning and who's losing. Again, theater, you're trying to tell a story. So 
by extending and leaning in and coming back and I'm telling the story and we're doing all these big things. Rolling ones, very common technique you'll see used a lot. Um, let's see, where else are we? I've got an idiot sheet here. Oh yeah, the Glasgow H. We don't know why it's associated with Glasgow, um, but the swords create a figure eight pattern if you're looking at it from above. This is also known as poop deck fighting. This is very common when you have your big pirate movies and you ran a thousand extras onto the poop deck of this, the, the, the pirate ship there, and there's not room to swing your sword and do a lot of movement, so you fight like you do when you're six. <laughs> and your swords are creating a figure eight pattern in the air. That's very common, Glasgow eights. It can also be done on a low line, you need a little bit more space there. And then you might go high. And that's all you do. Low, sorry, I'm going to Low, and then we go to high. Glasgow eights. So those are a few of the stock Victorian phrases that were used heavily over and over again, uh, that the, they would pass along to the actors. And then very quickly, you could put together fights. So we're gonna pretend like Kristen has just been cast in the, as the principal role in the She Musketeers. <laughs> She's doing an awesome job. All right. Because we got something there. I might have to start writing that. <laughs> All right, so let's say we just brought her on set. Oh, and this is another thing. Um, in the film community and in theater, not as much in theater, but in film and especially in television, they are notoriously bad for not giving their performers time to rehearse. Yes. Every single director and producer are like, oh yeah, we'll give you all sorts of training. It always gets pushed back. When you hear people talk about movies, Yes, we were training for six weeks prior to this film. No, you were probably getting paid for six weeks. You might have been on set for six weeks. You might have had an hour each day to practice. Just because so many other things always get precedence over uh, choreography. and It's just part of the business. So it's not unusual for somebody to show up on set the day that they're filming and have virtually no choreography in place. That happens all the time. Or you get on location and all of a sudden you have to change the choreography. Or the outfits are so tight you can't do the things that you wanted to do before. Or the shoes are slippery so you can't kick your feet. Or the actor pulled a hammy and, and can't do the lunges like, so you have to change things up all the time. That's very common. Um, so having these phrases uh, would help cobble together stage combat routines very quickly. So let's say we're fighting and we're just going to start off with a four count of a Glasgow A. So we're going to go one, two, three, four. That's our first phrase, all right? And then let's go into a, a, a high-low pattern. So we're going one, two, three, four. I'm going to cut to your outside, okay, and then you cut low, and then cut high again. Okay. So from the top, one, two, three, four, high. high. This is why we practice yep. low, <laughs> high. Once again, one, two, three, four, High, low, high. All right. So from there, oh, let's go into, we'll go into a pair of rolling ones. So from the top slowly, we're going to go one, two, three, four, high, low, high. Then you're going to attack my head. Uh, this way. Slash down, get rolling. And we'll do four of these. Two, three, four. All right. So from the top. We're going one, two, three, four, high, low, high, tack the head, roll one, two, three, four. Good. One more time. One, two, three, four, high, low, to the shoulder, head, two, three, and four. And very quickly, we can put together a fun, light, you know, fanciful dual scene. You know, that's, that's, and a lot of that type of stuff is what we would see in that golden age, Errol Flynn type of swashbuckling uh, adventure. Um, let us go ahead and roll on our tape here. Uh, we got two clips here in just a second. Um, first is obviously we're gonna show a, a brief clip of a fight scene from the Adventures of Robin Hood. We're gonna play it at normal speed 
and then we're going to see it again in slow motion. And we'll start to pick out some of those things that we were just seeing us do a second ago. And then we'll see how it influenced more modern cinema. <laughs> Not yet! <laughs> Jumping the gun there. <laughs> you put me on. All right, and then after this, we'll see a clip from The Princess Bride. Um, and same thing, we'll see it at normal speed, and then we'll see it again in slow motion. I wanted to try and find something more recent, and I'll go ahead and do this little thing. It's so difficult now to find good swordplay in movies where you can actually see the techniques. And this is one thing, one of the big downfalls of the fight scene in recent years. The, the, for whatever reason, and there's lots of people that can be faulted for it, either the, the director, the cinematographer, director of photography, um, the choreographer, or the actors themselves, they're obsessed with the shaky cam, sticking the camera in somebody's face, and we're moving it around because we're inside the fight. Um, a lot of times that's because the actors can't pull off the choreography, the choreography isn't good, or we haven't given ourselves enough time to do good choreography, um, or it's a, supposed to be a stylistic choice, but it really just gives people nausea. Um, and it's exhausting. You can't, it's so hard to find uh, a modern clip of sword fighting <laughs> where the camera holds still for more than a second and a half. It's chopping all over the place and there's almost nothing that I can use to demonstrate with this stuff. So we'll go with Princess Bride and it's a fan favorite anyway. So let's go ahead and, and roll tape on this. For real now? Yes, for real. Okay. All right, thank you. Oh, come on. And looks and grimacing, and who had garlic for lunch? And 
Push him back. The dagger magically disappears at this point. <laughs> and we're going for another faint high as you come underneath, get him in his stomach. He's just sliding it past his hip. We're constipated. <laughs> Should have eaten more fiber. And this, this is a great stunt fall, but this is fun. So his legs are high, his face is going towards us. And now we're feet first, facing away, because that's our awesome stunt guy. He's taking the brilliant fall, and that's the end of the scene. So a lot of that is just that high-low pattern, going back and forth, some changes of who is initiating the high-low pattern, who's pushing it forward, and who's going backwards. Um, so it's a very, very basic sequence, but it was one that's highly talented. So here's our Princess Bride, one of our favorite uh, swashbuckling films of our modern era. basically our poop deck fighting here, traveling back and forth, and he throws it into a little bit of a hanging parry just to add something different to it, and now we're coming backwards into our, oh, this is our low bell clinger, so we're doing two thrusts, he parries, parries, and then he returns it with his own, and then we go into our high-low pattern again, moving back and forth, and he's his turn to do the high-low pattern on the other side, coming back the other way. And now this gets creative. He has to throw his blade out and he has to find it because there's no way that would hit him. Same thing with that one as he switches hands again. He's actually tapping the blade, not actually going for the body again as he goes into his two hand slashes at the four corners there. Basically going up. And watch how far away the blade is from the body. It comes down a good two feet outside. He doesn't even have to move. And then when he goes into this, watch how far backwards he has to scoop to make sure that he's not going to hit him as he's doing his little twirlies. Um, and so that makes sure that they're not colliding. So he goes farther back on that. And then we do our dramatic hair flip for our Pantene commercial. And somehow, a magical hit on the top of your hilt makes you drop your sword <laughs> dramatically and bring your hand up in the frame. And, and then we have our great uh, dialogue here. So once again, it's very, very basic, uh, common phrases used over and over again but we're doing it while we're moving, we're doing different angles. They add a little bit of flash there with switching the hands and going behind the back. But again, that's, you know, that's not really, uh, and when he throws a sword out this way, there's no way that's gonna hit him. So his partner has to reach out and meet it, and then meet it up here. And then as he goes into the high cuts, he has to reach and extend and meet the sword, but it's fantasy, it's what we like to see. So we don't need this anymore, thank you. Um, where are we at our time? So, <clears throat> any questions about those clips that we saw before we move on? Yes? Oh, when, uh, he, when he hits his hair there at the end, what did they do there to make sure he didn't clip an ear? Or was, or he did I think he might have actually done that. that. That's a little risky. I think I would have wanted to try and do some sort of string, something. But I think he probably just said, I'm going to be really close, just outside of the frame. And I'm just going to come straight up. I think they actually did flip the hair for that bit. And of course, most of the, the movie swords, obviously they're blunt. Um, a lot of times, especially nowadays, we're using more and more uh, aluminum. These weren't. Uh, we see a lot of aluminum, rubber, um, bamboo that's been painted. And a lot of movies are even doing uh, hilts, <coughs> a little bit of uh, blade coming up, and then green tape on the end, and they'll CG the blade in later. You see that a lot, too. I have a question from the... Uh First Pirates of the Caribbean, those, those are a little thicker than these, correct? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So similar principle, but not quite as flimsy? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, and it's, it's pretty much the same style. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm try, I was trying to use Pirates, but again, there just wasn't enough blade work on camera. <coughs> Excuse me. 
for us to really learn anything from. Um, but yeah, it's the same type of thing. They kind of have those short uh, cutlasses, uh, but it's the same type of thing. In fact, uh, if you want to hand me those long swords. Yeah. This is kind of a modular system. This works in a lot of different scenarios. So we just get finished shooting, uh, what did I call it? She Musketeers? Yeah. <laughs> and now they, that went so well, she's been ca cast as uh, Queen Arthur and her Knights oh, of the Round yes. Table. <laughs> so we're, we're switching over to long swords for this one, right? So we're, we're more uh, medieval-ish, as all those type of movies try to be and never quite get it right. But that's okay. It's, it's movie. It's fantasy. Um, once again, our glorious directors and producers left us no time to rehearse or do choreography. And they just thought, huh, you did so well on that last movie, let's just do the same thing again. Nobody will know the difference. The audience is stupid, right? Yeah, they'll pay for anything. So we're going to keep the same choreography. We're just switching weapons. So we're coming in for our four count Glasgow A. So, and again, we try to play up the, the, the weight of the sword, which again, if you get a chance to come down to the armory and we'll actually let you hold some of these weapons, uh, the steel ones, medieval long swords typically weigh no more than three, three and a half pounds, maybe four. They're a lot lighter than most people think. Um, medieval or uh, medieval single-handed arming swords, two, two and a half pounds. So the weight <coughs> that you see people putting into it on screen or on stage is fanciful. Um, so we're going into our four count, black go eight, three, and four, and then I'm going to cut to her, and she's going to block, and she's going to cut down to my thigh, and I'm going to block, and then I'm going to cut to the shoulder, and then she's going to cut to my head, and oh no, I'm going to block here, and block here, ah, and uh, I forget. that's it, that's oh, the end, yay. <laughs> so you remember it all. So once again, um, four count for black go eight, and one, two, three. I cut to your shoulder, you cut to my leg, I cut to your shoulder. Ah, I you went to a, a hanging carry, which is I awesome. Did. Let's keep going. Cut okay. to my head. Alright, <laughs> there you go. And four. And we come on guard and move to our next scene. So, <laughs> the same choreography that we just used with these incredibly light, flimsy fencing swords can be used in a pinch for these more brutal cleavers, you know? Um, and that's kind of why they taught this system the way they did, because it could be used in a wide variety of productions, be it on stage, on screen. Um, and that kind of influenced a lot of what we see today, um, for better or for worse. Um, nowadays, we have the benefit of having dozens, if not hundreds, of historic fencing manuals. So um, people like me who really love both are trying really hard to push more historically accurate fighting into cinematic projects. It's not easy, it's an uphill battle for a wide variety of reasons. Um, but we're, the, the attempt, attempts are being made. Yeah, question. Kingdom of Heaven. Oh yes, yes. Where, where Raza Ghul teaches Will Turner. Right? <laughs> um, funny thing about that, you know, and again, this, this actually works out perfectly. Um, in that movie, in fact, in that scene where he's training him in the woods, he tells him uh, about Posta de Falcone, right? You remember that? He said, this is Posta del Falcone. And that is actually historically accurate. That is an Italian longsword guard, albeit from the mid-1400s. And Kingdom of Heaven takes place, was 1168, something like that. So we're about 300 years ahead of our time and it's also Italian, and he wasn't, maybe it existed, but the thing that's funny about that is right after that, he tells them there are no low guards. <laughs> in the very book that we learn about posted of Falcone, in fact, on the very same page, no, two inches to the left <laughs> of the image that shows posted of Falcone, we see Iron Door which is a low guard. All he has to do is look two inches to the left, and we see a low guard. In fact, the Italian system that posted to Falcone in is in. It's by a guy named Vadi. There is at least four or five low guards. So I don't know why they added that bit of dialogue, if he was just confused, or it was a longer scene, and the producer said, this is taking too long. Let's just say, 
there are no low guards, and everyone says, yes, sir, you signed the checks. So, <laughs> that, you know, that's a perfect example of uh, this kind of, you know, Hollywood swashbuckling. But they said, hey, we'll use this historical term, a <coughs> little out of place, little mistakes in there. Um, but, you know, it, it was an attempt. All right, we'll give them that. Yeah. Just to clarify, we have used to say, don't use the low guard. Did you say don't use the low guard? Yes. Which is silly because it's a complete part of the martial art. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah, it, the, if you study the, the, the martial art, there's, there's a ton of techniques. In fact, I'll show you one right now. If she takes up Costa del Falcone, and I'll go into the exact same image we see from that page, there's a technique called full iron or a porta de ferro or something or other. I'm, yeah. My Italian's bad. But it's basically I'm you're standing like teacher. this. I can help you. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you'd be able to talk circles around us. So I'm standing like this. She's standing like that. So she's going to cut down on my head. It doesn't matter how strong that cut is, I can deflect and intercept it. Um, another thing I can do is she cuts down. I can go into, a German is called a crawl, I can't remember, frontale, post it frontale? Yes. Sounds about right? Yes. Period up here, come over the top, yep. all sorts of things. So in the system that teaches post it Falcone, it also teaches there's a great amount of low guards. Why they did it for that film, we don't know. Um, yeah. Um, so, question, kind of, kind of two pointed questions. So, one um, great sword technique that was shown in great detail on screen was actually um, in Phantom Menace with two single hilts versus one double hilt, um, which actually looked not a lot of quick cuts, just actually quite a lot of long takes where you can actually see the technique. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I guess that that's sort of a mixture of just traditional single versus. Yeah, uh, like and actually, we've got, a, we got another panel. Is that tomorrow? It, yeah, the lightsaber one? Yeah. Yes, yeah. tomorrow at 1130, we're doing a panel specifically on, uh, we're, we're calling it Lightsabers Awaken. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're basically taking the lightsaber and say, is this thing, if this thing was real, what would we actually do with it as martial arts? How would a real lightsaber fight, fight look? Like, like uh, the root of it, is it blending like traditional single blade, double handed with According with to staff. Nick Gillard, the, the fight <laughs> choreographer, he said it was a mixture of fencing, kendo, tennis, and tree chopping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, and, and as, as I, you know, as he says that, you look at it like, oh my gosh, that guy's serving. You know, he's returning ball. You know, uh, yes, he's chopping down a tree. You know, like, wow, he's, that's surprisingly accurate. Um, so a lot of times, especially with uh, fantasy related sword fighting, They'll look to other things to try and, you know, play with it, you know. Um, it, so it's, it's, there are some, with most movies, you'll watch it, and if you understand martially what's going on, it'll be like, okay, that works, that not so much, no, that's horrible, yeah, that's good, okay, that was all right, no. So it's a mixed bag of good and bad, um, and they pull techniques from all over the place a lot of times. A lot of times, fight choreographers who are rooted in this type of system might pick up a historic manual and say, oh, that's a cool pose. I want to use that in my scene. How can I get into that mm -hmm. position? Because I like the way that looks. A lot of times, they'll do that. So they'll just pick and choose from different sources. Um, not every production needs strict historical accuracy. Um, nobody wants to see the court jester done accurately. If you've ever seen that great musical with Danny Kaye, and he spends, uh, he goes, he, he gets put basically under a spell, and he, when somebody snaps their fingers, he alternates from this sniveling weasel to like the greatest swordsman ever. So he spends a lot of his fight in panic, you know, swatting it back and forth as Basil Rathbone is trying to kill him. Um, and it's silly, it's very fun, it's ridiculous. Nobody wants to see a serious, accurate portrayal of that show. It doesn't work, you know? Um, a lot of things like Pirates of Penzance, you know, it's silly. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be light. You don't need the really brutal, historically accurate techniques in that kind of production. So a lot of times, the show that you're doing will determine how much you might want to use accuracy versus uh, this flamboyant stuff that we see from the early days of, of Hollywood. Just Let's like, get over here real quick and I'll come back to you. No, it's just, um, you've been saying that only here recently there's been historically accurate um, 
source is coming about, is that due to archives that have been closed for so long? And, and the papers only just internet. Kind of because of the... Yeah. So you're saying about internet, not, not academic type mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yep. Nowadays, we have the ability to go into these uh, libraries or private collections mm -hmm. that have only have, haven't really been known to many people and scan okay. these documents. And in a matter of hours, it can be in the hands of thousands of historic martial artists around the world. We can translate, interpret it, take it into our clubs and say, all right, let's figure out how this thing works. And, and if it doesn't seem like it works, then we're probably doing it wrong. Let's go back to the source material and refigure it out again. Let's look at our translations again. Uh, but, and that's all, you know, because of the, the advancements in technology and, and web stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. It depends on who you ask. <laughs> Both of them, I've heard that uh, Errol Flynn was probably one of the most athletically gifted men in Hollywood. Basil Rathbone did train fencing quite a bit. So if you're just going just on sword fighting potential alone in the sport fencing context, maybe Basil would have been a little bit more technically sound. Um, but they both were, were per they, they trained a lot. And that, and that was in an era uh, where things are a little bit different. Now they were in the era of the agent. Every film is a, is a private contract. As soon as you finish one movie, you rely on your agent to go out and get you another movie. Back then, you were basically purchased by MGM. And so you'd go every single day to work to MGM, and they would put you in whatever movie they happened to be shooting today. So they just pump things out over and over again. And that type of scenario, you could have a gym set up there where you just, you know, at 3 o'clock, I can go and do my fencing training. You know, that's what I do every single day. Nowadays, the agency system, that doesn't really exist unless you set something up privately on your own, you know. So that's, that's a big shift in how things are done nowadays versus back then. So, yeah. Are you familiar with the film Deluge, Polish film? Deluge? Deluge, yeah, it's a 1970s film. Is that the, the saber fight in the rain? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that was very, very good. There's, a, there's also the duelist with one of the Carradines. Yeah, Keith Carradine and... Um, I can't remember... Harvey uh, Keitel. Yes, you're right. Yeah, Thanks. Both, both yeah, the, the, the duelist has uh, both good, very good small sword fight and then military saber. Um, that's one of the few films that, as martial artists, we can say that one's done pretty darn accurately. Uh, that one and Rob Roy's another one that's uh, usually a fan favorite as far as um, you know, things that are pretty close to how blades actually work and what legitimate techniques would be. And they're both Bill Hobbs films. So. Yeah, Bill Hobbs, amazing fight choreographer who sadly is no longer with us. He did pass, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah a couple of years ago. Um, but yeah, he did a lot of really good stuff. And he, he's one of the few early choreographers, I say early, uh, guys that came up through the 60s and 70s who did spend a little bit of time in these manuals. He understood what a real fight was supposed to look like and uh, incorporated that into some of his pictures. So, very good, very good. Yes? Quick question. Yeah. So. Um, if we have our, our hero with our broadsword, like say Aragorn versus the ogre with a bludgeoning weapon, you know, how, mm -hmm. how is that, uh, what's the variety in the technique there? Uh, similar or different? Well, it depends on what story you're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. um, later on tonight, uh, I hope we'll get into it a little bit, depends on the rest of the panel, but writing and fighting. Most fights are about obtaining a goal. Mm -hmm. You're trying to kill somebody or not be killed. You're trying to maybe wound them and talk some sense into them, or perhaps you're trying, maybe it's a judicial duel to a first blood, maybe you're trying to get to a location, I gotta get to that door and she's there to protect it. It's, fighting has to be about a story, it's about a goal. Um, so in that type of situation, and then it de also depends on the characters and what their background is. Uh, the the Urukai were just barely born. They're all instinct. Okay? And their instinct is, is heavy and it's bludgeoning and it's this big cudgel thing, so it's, it's, it's uh, rough. Aragorn's had a lot of training. He's also exhausted. So your fatigue factor will determine how you know, controlled your movements are. Um, so in that type of situation, yeah, you're going to have this big cleaver coming in doing these big cuts like we see. And Aragorn's doing his best to deflect that 
and counter. You know, it's, 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 it's an okay fight. It does pretty good. The, they kind of lost me on the shield throw that pins up against the wood. <laughs> and it's here, and I'm stuck, and suddenly I'm not. I don't know how that really happens <laughs> in physics, but it's fantasy. Um, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. We have fun, and he looks beautiful doing it. So that's all yes, he does. <laughs> then he lops off his arm and all that fun stuff in his head. So, um, But yeah, the, the characters and the character's background, uh, what type of tradition are they coming from? Aragorn obviously was trained in Elvish uh, fighting, and he's got his own experience with the Rangers, so he's very well-rounded as a fighter mm -hmm. um, and shows that. Um, the Rokai, again, is all instant. It was mm -hmm. just barely created, hashed out of the gooey thing. I don't know what that was. The, <laughs> the gooey thing. The gooey thing. Oh, thing you said. Yes, sir. Um, I realize you guys do European and Western, mm -hmm. but um, in the Chinese and Japanese movies, are they kind of doing similar theatrical fighting? It depends on the picture and what type of production it is. <laughs> um, the, the advantage that Japanese or Asian cinema has over us is a lot of them are participating in fight camps. Like, you'll have groups of guys that produce movies together. Um, but probably one of the best examples nowadays is the guys that produce The Raid. Mm -hmm. Familiar with that movie? Yeah. Um, those guys all work in a team together, you know? And so their, their expertise level in that style of fighting is much higher than what you'd see in Western cinema because they're kind of staying together kind of like the old studio system. Mm -hmm. um, we don't really have so much of that over here. Um, but they certainly do have their own series of techniques that they use over and over again. Core techniques that are easy to produce and, and easy to replicate. It becomes even easier when you train with the guys on a daily basis. Um, and you'll see the exact same stunt guys, the exact same leads in all of their films because they're part of a team and they do their thing really, really good. Um, and so that's why we don't really see, um, when you hear about martial arts movies, you automatically think Asian. Um, even though that could apply to any style of fighting, but it's that particular focus on the fighting that isn't really seen a lot in Western cinema. And I think largely it's because they can't pull it off because they don't have the dedication to training as a team like those guys do. Um, so I hope that kind of answers that. Any other questions? Still have 17 minutes. 17 minutes? Okay. Yes. Yes, again. What's your favorite weapon? Just across the board. <laughs> favorite, I'm a big uh, fan. Favorite uh, uh, older weapon. Oh, uh, like, uh, like a sword. Favorite kind oh, of sword. Okay, yeah. or like a I'm a big fan of the basket hilt broadsword. Okay. Um, I, I think that's very good. It cuts well. It thrusts decent. It's a nice armored fist when things get in close. You can rearrange some teeth. Um, I'm also a very big fan of long sword. Um, I know Kristen likes Yeah, it's like long sword. Long, long sword is such sword. a versatile weapon. Um, they called it the, basically the foundational weapon. If you learn how to use the longsword really good, your transition into other weapons is much simpler. Um, that and wrestling. You've got to know how to wrestle. Like, speaking of longswords, thinking about like, uh, like battle type fighting, not so much a duel, but mm -hmm. like I'm thinking about Braveheart with a giant claymore, which is meant to be like the giant... Uh, large slashing weapon against hopefully multiple people. Mm -hmm. So just talking about how that technique is, you know, in those kind of situations. The, the when we start talking about true two-handed swords, and again the, the, the sword that Mel Gibson uses in Braveheart is actually a German sword and it wouldn't have been invented until around the fifteen hundreds, mm. give or take. That's okay. Kilts didn't come around until the sixteen hundreds anyway, but <laughs> it's fantasy. It's Hollywood. They do what they want. Um, with yeah. Scottish. yeah, nobody wants Mel Gibson in pants. <laughs> <laughs> we want him without pants. <laughs> All right. Um, but the big two-handers, uh, the, 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 the two-handed claymores, the Schweihanders, the Montantes, those big five, six-foot long swords. Montantes. Montantes. Those are a lot of fun. <laughs> you do have to alter your technique to, to use those things. They do work in dueling as well as in, um, as in war. Um, if we're pretending like this is a long one, a very common technique that would be used um, is a technique called half sorting. And this is especially important when you're fighting people in armor. It's where you grip the blade portion of your sword and you use it for leverage or to shorten the distance. Right. Um, so if she's got a smaller, lighter weapon and she's trying to close in on me, 
I might have a harder time getting my big great sword around to fight her. So all of a sudden, I have a very short spear that I can do use very quickly uh, to parry and deflect. A lot of times, especially on the German right handers, uh, you'll see these hooks that kind of come out halfway up the, the ricasso here. So you have your normal hilt, and then you have these short hooks that come out around here. That's to protect your hand when you go to that half sword technique to shorten that grip. But you also see it in regular long sword fighting. It also becomes very important when you're grappling. Because a lot of times when you fight, you'll you know, fight and you wind in close, and all of a sudden cutting becomes irrelevant. In Hollywood, this is our favorite place to do this. Aha, I got a nice frame here, and we're going to uh, growl at each other and say things about each other's parentage and, and whatever and stuff like that. And then we'll push away and do this thing. In a real fight, we're going here, and we're probably going to half sort it, and we're going to start winding into the gaps, trying to find position to either get a tip on, a hilt into the face, or to try and maybe throw somebody right. grappling. Can I drop your sword in earnest? Yes. <laughs> and so there's, that's realistically what would happen with some of those longer two-handed swords, is that they would go into the half sword and grip for close-in fighting um, when they weren't able to get the big cuts. Mm -hmm. And again, even those types of swords that got the five, five and a half, six feet long, usually about six to seven pounds tops, some a little bit lighter than that. So they're not nearly as heavy as, uh, as most people think. What are they typically wearing on their hand at that point? Uh, so you actually use something called like a monkey paw grip. So it is like this, and your, your hand is not actually against the, the ick. Okay. Now, the way that it pinches there too, your hand's not moving, so it doesn't cause a cut. The cut only happens if the, the sharp end is moving right. on your skin. Yeah. So as long as you've got that grip there, you've actually, you're, you're usually going to be pretty good. And they should actually show the historical manuals, people practicing this bare hand, not anything on their hands at all. So, there's a great technique uh, called the Mordschlag, murder stroke. Um, yeah, and basically you're in a half sword technique, and uh, you know, I might, or I don't, you can be, I don't even have to be. Say I'm coming in, I'm closing, and she basically clubs me over the head with the hilt. So great. And pommel. So even if we're at distance, I might be back here, yeah. you know, kind of coming in, and all of a sudden I'm like, shoot, <clears throat> club down straight like that. Morchlon, murder stroke, great thing. I think I've seen it in maybe one or two movies. It might have been an Ironclad. Maybe, maybe. But it's uh, cool, right? It's very cool. cool. We should do that more. Yeah, yeah. people do that. I know, right? It's, it's awesome stuff. So that, there's a whole just wealth of information that's available in a lot of these historic manuals that has largely been ignored by a lot of choreographers. They're starting to, to take notice and starting to get it in and learn how to teach it safely. That's the big thing. It's got to tell the story and you've got to be able to be safe with your actors because nobody wants a thrust to the face to go into your multi-million dollar actress. Oh, that sucks. You know, that, that's bad. We really don't want to do that. So we got to alter things slightly to make sure we keep her safe. If, uh, if I encase, like, you know, I'm just a lowly stunt guy, so they give me the crap shoes, right? So if I go in for my thrust and all of a sudden I slip on that wet grass, all of a sudden she's got steel in her face. So, yes? Going off the uh, murder stroke technique, yeah. um, I know a few techniques. Uh, going with the pummel, could you demonstrate some of those? I know one where you can use a cross guard to block a murder stroke, you can pull it down and you pummel it in their sternum. Yes. Yeah. Um, all <laughs> sorts of stuff. I like techniques. I do a little yeah. myself. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. techniques are fun. So there's, uh, yeah, if, um, okay, if you're cutting down at my head, yeah. I can do this, and I can come down with the hilt and then come in with that. Or if I'm doing the, the march lock, the murder stroke, I come in, and let's say, let's say, what am I par doing? Parry and half sword. Okay. So I come in here and you block hop, right? So now I can use that to jerk this down here, boom, pop her in the face like that. Um, uh, give me a, a cut to the head. Displace this way, pop, come in that way. So there's all sorts, the whole weapon is a weapon, yeah. not just the edge. <laughs> so lots of fun stuff that can be done with this thing, yeah. Would you also say that the reason why a lot of the fight scenes might not seem as accurate is because in an actual fight anything goes, 
And, and I was just saying the safety of the, of the actors, actresses who don't actually have any of this, that really does down, downgrade exactly how many positions you might be able to do. I mean, would that be a reason? A fil- any movie, especially period films and especially big budget period films, it's an absolute miracle when a movie gets made. There is so much chaos, there is so much drama, and you're just hemorrhaging money. It's ridiculous. It's, it's absolutely asinine that somebody would want to make a movie, but uh, it's, it's amazing. So there's so many fingers in the pie that what might have started out as a great concept can change by the end. Even the editor at the end might think, ooh, I'm gonna chop this up and make it really fast and kinetic, and all of a sudden your wonderful, beautiful choreography that was performed expertly by your actors, perfectly shot, has now been chopped up and, and you know, like, done in this segment, so. This happened with one of like, the, the fights in the Avengers with like, uh, Black Widow. Like, I heard this whole story where they, like, there was this gorgeous thing. And it <laughs> got chopped up, you know, for whatever reason, and again, and whether that's a director's decision, a producer's decision, or the test audience said, oh, this fight's going on a little long. I wish I had more close-ups of Scarlett Johansson's rear end. And so they say, okay, that's what we're going to do because they're the paying audience. Right. It happens all the time. And whether it's actors that can't do it, whether it's a choreographer who's just not got all of his stuff together, or the DP wants to do all shaky cam, or the director said, yo, you know it'd be cool if you jumped up here in there and did a 360 thing and then chopped her in the head and all of your historical accuracy stuff is just gone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, you're signing the check. And see, that's the other thing. As, the, as, a, as a performer, as a choreographer, whatever your position is, if you start throwing attitude their way and say, no, this is my vision, I will be historical, you're replaceable. You're so replaceable. <clears throat> um, and you don't want to get labeled as somebody who's difficult to work with. So you're saying, yes, sir, absolutely. I don't know why I didn't think of that. I will do it right away. Um, and that's just the nature of the business. So there's any number of reasons why a fight scene might get watered down from where it could be or where original, originally it was written. It's just, there's just so many people working on a project. Any one of those can cause it. Okay, so like on the TV series on the History Channel, The Vikings. Yes. Do you notice there's, there's hardly any spear Play out there at all, and the Vikings, you know, they thrived off. Of they spear. thrived off the of spears. Vikings, I, I, I have to be a little bit biased. We, um, uh, Richard Ryan is the choreo- one of the choreographers for that, and he's he's well acquainted in the Society of American Fight Directors. We like him a lot. He's he's also the ones who did Troy. Um, he did uh, the. Sherlock Holmes movies with uh, Robert Downey Jr. Oh, those uh, are so good. What else did he do? Stardust. Stardust. Oh, gosh, that's Stardust. great. Again, another great example of a movie where you don't really want it done accurately. How in the world do you Stardust. accurately portray someone who's been voodoo dolled and is dead and is broken? And it's, it's a fantastic <laughs> fight scene. So right. Remember that scene? Yeah. Great scene. Um, but with, with, with Vikings, again, Whenever you're, especially you're talking about spears, it's all thrusting, and that's scary when you start packing in hundreds of extras. It gets really, really dangerous, and it's not, it's perceived as being not quite as exciting on film. You have armies of people lined up, exchanging thrusts, and maybe you got shields, so you can't hardly see anybody. It's just a lot of sticks coming forward, and that's really how things work a lot. And so somebody went down, and all of a sudden there's a hole, and then we're rushing in. That's not nearly as exciting as, as somebody jumping over the top of an axe and cleaving somebody through the head and then we bum rush everybody. So a little bit of storytelling, a little bit of being friendly to the audience, and then a, lot, a little bit of, of safety. It's scary, yeah. So historically, is there a sense of somebody who's an expert uh, swordsman or a spear fighter, how much of their experience is pure training in sport versus how many life or death battles they actually been in? So, since theoretically, if you're getting with a sword in pre-medical time, if you get infected, you might die. Uh-huh. How, many, how many actual real life or death fights would an expert swordsman have been in in the Middle Ages or the Renaissance? It, it completely depends. I mean, it's, it's hard to know, especially looking back, the records that exist, how much is real and how much is um, exaggerated or embellished. Uh, we have records of people that survived, you know, dozens if not almost 100 duels before. Uh, Rob Roy was, what, 60, 70 duels according to his records, something like that, and he lived, he died of old age, you know. Um, we have a great, some great accounts from Fiore, mm-hmm. 
um, where he took on several times uh, multiple opponents at once, and he lived to a ripe old age. That's another one where Musashi, Musashi, Miyamoto, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so we, yeah. Did you remember? Who? Well, I don't remember the name, but it was a guy who was <laughs> in one particular duel, and he had like nine stab wounds, and was ended up being fine. Yeah. Like. They were going fought through all those battles, and he still had all of his fingers. Yeah, he's a fancy guy. He's a little fancy guy. Saddle on him, right? Yeah, no, it's, yeah I um, imagine you'd lose your fingers pretty easily, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. depending on the, the weapon, but yeah. Um, I, don't, I highly doubt. Um, American cinema isn't as influenced by, say, like Wuxia um, in China. Mm -hmm. with the, or it is, so it does come, inspiration does come the other way? Or not Not nearly as much. It's not nearly that as much. That technique is unbelievable. Yeah, Wushu and, and a lot of the, the Japanese stuff and Asian stuff, you'll see coming out of like the, the Chinese theaters and the Chinese operas and those type of things. And it's combined with a lot of wire work. So there's, yeah, you will see some of that influencing. Like there was the, a um, couple of years ago, there was a, a version of the Musketeers where they used Asian Hong Kong style fight choreography. Um, Tim Roth was in it. Was uh, the Musketeer. Played, uh, it was called Just the Musketeer. Right. It's a very, it's basically saying we're going to take our, Holly, our Con uh, Hong Kong style cinema and put it into a European story. So, yeah, there are there's some crossovers, but again, it's, it's not really something that a lot of American cinema people go for. Every now and then a movie will catch on. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was huge here. Hero was pretty big. Um, House of Daggers. House yeah, of House of Flying Daggers. Daggers. That's another good one. Um, so there is some some crossover, um, but it, it just depends on audience. We're we're so impatient as an average American audience. Um, a lot of that stuff is just lost. Um, yeah. Five. Actually, one. Three now. Three, two, one. Mm -hmm. Just about. All right. Any final questions? Yeah. Can I go back to the the Vikings? How does the techniques you you were showing us at the beginning? Mm -hmm. Change when you start incorporating shields and axes. I'm assuming it's like short camera shots, but well, it's it's the same. You're still addressing the same principle of telling a story and keeping the actors safe. So where you know I, I you know again and again depends on how much time you have to. <laughs> if somebody's coming in with a with an axe cut, I don't have anything. Yeah, you know, and I, my my idea is I'm going to deflect it with the the shield and come in. You know, and count, and then she's got she, and so a lot of it would get very close, and we bind each other up. But you know, for for show, for cinema, you know, uh, and this is the big pet peeve of mine. Anytime you see somebody with a weapon and a shield, you almost always will see this. I will have my shield in my left hand, and I'll be fighting somebody like this, aha, aha, and then I'll come up and I'll block here, and I'll go, aha, aha. what is that thing doing back there? Why do you have that? As opposed to being here and cutting around the yep. shield, but in the process, I'm covering my this yes. beautiful face, and especially if it's somebody that you're paying a lot of money for, you want that thing down and out of the way. Let's see their physique. In fact, take his shirt off, no armor, you know, <laughs> or, or or give her a leather bikini and put some blue paint on her, and that's going to be sexy. Off. And, and we're going to be big and wide open moves, so you can see our multi-million dollar actor or actress. So a lot of times those type of decisions will affect what they end up doing uh, on screen more than what would actually work. It's like the so, one minute. One more question? Yes, in front. All right. A lot of times if you're watching like a TV show or movie, your training montages also contain things like flexibility and balance and holding barrels or you have know, things of water or whatever. How much of that translates? Maybe not, you know, standing on fence posts, but <laughs> translates to like real life training with weapons. Oh, okay, good question. Flexibility. Yeah, obviously, you know, flexibility is a big thing. Endurance. What we talk about when we're actually training people for either chemo or armored fighting, um, we do a lot of type Tabata type of works out. So you're familiar with that? Yes. Or hit uh, high intensity interval, interval. training, yep. yeah. that type of thing. That works out really well for getting strong for quick bursts of action, uh, but then in the process you're building, you know, long endurance. We do a lot of traditional exercise, we do a lot of kettlebell work, um, and then just training with the weapon, you know, we do a lot of... Um, working out on the pel. Yeah, working out on a pel, which is practice post, you know, just getting those techniques down. 
um, and repetition, but as far as just like your, your athletic regimen, um, those type of, I don't want to say the word CrossFit, because that has all the advantage to it, but some of that style of stuff is good for building up a good core. Anything that builds your core is great. The arms will come, you know, depending on the weapon you use. Obviously, something, even though they're not that heavy, a long sword weighs a little bit more than one of these things, but your arm is extended a lot. So you've got to have good shoulders and finger strength to be able to manipulate that blade as well. And that's so, time. That's it. Thank you so much for coming. We'll do a few more minutes.